Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics, a podcast dedicated to exploring how things get places and the people who get them there. We'll talk with logistics and supply chain leaders about innovation, industry trends, and the future of the logistics business. Now, here's your host, Joe Lynch. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Logistics of Logistics podcast. My name is Joe Lynch. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today, we got a great topic. Today's topic is building supply chain resiliency with Richard Sharp. Hey, Richard. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much. I've enjoyed talking to Richard while we prepped. He has been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And this is a great topic, especially now as we've all kind of just endured maybe the worst part of COVID in terms of supply chain disruption, but it's not our last disruption. So we'll be talking to Richard a little bit about how we can get that supply chain resiliency. So next time we have a crisis and we are going to have another crisis, we're prepared. So Richard, please introduce yourself and your company and where you live. I am the CEO of Competitive Insights and I live in Atlanta, Georgia. And we provide visibility with regard to profit contributions by product, by customer, and by channel in order to be able to support decisions that are key to a company. So being able to think about ways that you can grow smartly, as a great example of that is the announcement last week from Coca-Cola, where they were actually reducing their portfolio by 200 brands in order to focus on the products that were going to be more strategic and more profitable for their growth. So providing that type of visibility is key for the future, we think, for supply chains. Yeah, it's interesting that you use the term visibility, which anyone who listens to my podcast hears that a lot, that they hear it in different ways. What you're saying is kind of, you know, in terms of insights, insights into my business. And what's interesting, and we'll get more into this in, a, in you know, in the podcast, but I don't think in logistics business, everyone always has an idea of what customers cost them. They know kind of their hard numbers, but I don't think they apply how many hours do we spend on that client? You know, because I remember when I was still managing a third party logistics company, we had some customers. I was like, we can't be making any money on them if we were really allocating the hours that we spend on them. Yep. There's a great story for that, Joe. If you looked at a company that, let's say, had a 110,000 delivery locations through wholesalers, distributors, and direct to serve, this is a fairly typical outcome. How many out of 110,000 would you say would give a company on average 80% of their profit? I don't know. We do the 80 20. So let's just say 20,000 and make most of the money. Yep. That's the very common answer. But the reality of it is, is less than 3%. 2,833 locations gave a company 80% of their profit. Oh, man. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the, when we were talking today, we mentioned Tim Ferriss. He wrote the four hour work week. And if you ever listen to that book, by the way, I work a lot more than four hours still, Tim. Thanks for nothing. (laughs) But um, (laughs) I don't think I'm applying it correctly. But he had a business that was absolutely killing him. And this is the story he tells. And he says, it was absolutely killing me, making a lot of money. But he, at a certain point, he says, I don't care. It's killing me. He went to Europe and he said, I need to take a vacation. And he really tried to put his business as much as he could on autopilot. You know, he had some people helping him who were outsiders, uh, you know, contract companies. And eventually he came back and got rid of a number of his customers. And he said, because only a few of them were where the majority of the money came. And he said, and the majority of the hassle came from the a big chunk of customers who he wasn't making that much money from anyway. Yep. And then he restructured some other customers. So he said, so they could actually be good customers. Yep. Well, it's really, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, when you're thinking about that, being able to reduce complexity and be able to focus on the customers and the products that matter the most, it's just smart business. Yep. Well, we'll get more into that in a minute. So before we go any further, Richard, tell us a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Give us some career highlights prior to starting Competitive Insights. Oh, sure. Well, I grew up in a small town in north central Florida called Crescent City, 6,000 people. We had one street light and they would turn it off at 10 o'clock at night until a semi took it down. And now that street light blinks all night long. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very fortunate to be able to go to the University of Florida for my undergraduate. And then I did my graduate work at Georgia Tech. And I was involved in the first interactive scheduling routine for the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Fleet. 
So if you remember in the old movies where they were moving ships around with these long poles or sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Honestly, that's actually what they were doing. And we created an optimization routine using a computer with a map, which was unheard of back then. And we actually figured out how to optimize the assignment of the ships. But it wasn't, you know, the coverage on the sea is obviously required. It's a constraint. But the actual optimization was to have the crews in port as long as possible. So you wanted happy crews while you were having coverage on the sea. So that was great. And that work actually allowed me to join Western Electric, AT&T back then. We were applying that research to their manufacturing operations. And from there, my mentor at AT AT&T was selected to go down to set up Bell South, uh, one of the Southeast region Bell operating companies. And my role was to help set up the IT infrastructure for the supply chain for Bell South. And I did that for a little over eight years. Then I went over to a little company you would not have heard of called Computer-Aided Planning and Scheduling, but may have heard of CAPS Logistics. We started the world of supply chain optimization, and we were very focused on helping companies be able to make better decisions in designing their networks and thinking about transportation and routing and scheduling. But it was really a great ride where we were under Windows 1.0, we were actually providing (laughs) solutions in that arena. So, you know, that was really great and a lot of very good customers, a lot of dedicated work really launched that whole idea of being able to use computers and analytics to be able to uh, help solve real problems. From there, we started Competitive Insights 21 years ago now, and it continues to be a great ride. Enjoy it very much and certainly enjoy having people be able to get great answers associated with whatever problems they're trying to focus on from a supply chain perspective. So why did you want to start Competitive Insights? What gap did you see in the, or what hole did you see in the market? Oh, that's a great question. So when we would go through that with, uh, you know, we did 24 countries for Coca-Cola, six national deployments for waste management, all kinds of industries. The issue always was that people would be concerned about the quality of their data as it relates to actually doing the analytics. So, you know, we would do a network design or we would do some, you know, very focused initiative for the problem that they were having. And the clients were very engaged. The work was great. But someone in the organization would raise their hand and go, you know, this is such a key decision for our company. I'm just not that confident in the data that we use to do it. Like what would be typical? What data would you be talking about and what would be wrong with it? Well, the data is going to come from a variety of sources. If you think about it, you know, people have multiple instances of SAP or they have some data in a TMS system and some data over in a warehouse management system and Excel spreadsheets. So being able to first say that the data is correct and then be able to tie that together in order to solve whatever problem they wanted to solve is not an easy task. And so people are, you know, they're hesitant to make decisions because of that very fact. So you have to solve that in order to be able to put analytics at the forefront of decision making. Yeah, that, you know, that's interesting. Some, I'm an automotive guy initially. That's how I spent my early part of my career. And I remember looking sometimes at quality data and you'd like to think, okay, we're going to go look at the highest quality, you know, the biggest quality problems and go after them and make product designs or changes to manufacturing or processes. And when you start looking at quality problems, you would find out, oh, well, this is, this happens on, you know, 1% of the cars. That's a lot of cars we're having this problem with or 2% of the cars. So we need to address that. And then the next question was, well, yeah, but it's wildly expensive and it's not a safety issue. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, should we fix it? And so, so as soon as we start saying, well, this is a problem that's going to, you know, potentially hurt somebody. Well, that one has to be taken care of first. And that, but there was all this data that we would get. And if you looked at one measure, you go, oh, well, we absolutely have to fix this one. You look at the second measure. Oh, wait a sec. Look at the third one. And we had data that would guide us (laughs) into running in circles sometimes. It was all the data was correct. It's just what to do with it was problematic. Yeah. And everybody deals with that. You know, I would sign in blood that the data was good, but our process for making decisions from it was a problem. Right. 
And the interpretation of it. Absolutely. There's no question. I mean, look at a typical SNOP meeting. You know, people will come in with their laptop. Please explain that. What is that? Oh, uh, sales and operations planning. I'm sorry. So it's all about thinking about how to plan for the next operating period for a company. So you'll have finance, you have sales, you'll have supply chain, manufacturing, marketing, and they're all in the same room and they're putting together a plan of, you know, how are we going to actually go to market for this next period of time? And they'll all have data from their various functional systems. So, you know, they'll come in and what should be, you know, how are we moving forward? Oftentimes, half that meeting is, why didn't it work last time? Right. You know, right. exactly to your point. All right. So let's get into today's topic. And I know this, there's some overlap to this. So today's topic is building supply chain resiliency. So first off, before we go any further, Richard, give us a definition for what is supply chain resiliency. Supply chain resiliency is the ability to apply resources to minimize the either current or possible future disruption of the supply chain. So there are two elements where you want resiliency to be applied. The first is if an event has occurred that you did not anticipate. So some disruption that is significant, and now you have to deal with it in a way that minimizes the financial impact. So I'll cite COVID. No one anticipated the impact that we're seeing from COVID today. How do you deal with that? And how do you deal with that efficiently with the resources that you have to apply for it? But the second part is being able to be proactive. So where should I be looking where I'm vulnerable on my end-to-end supply chain, a global supply chain? I have so much resources and I need to be sure that I'm applying them correctly. So where am I vulnerable and where should I prioritize the application of resources to reduce that vulnerability? So resiliency is the ability to protect the operation of the supply chain in such a way that it will minimize where it would hurt most, either if the event has occurred or the event may occur in the future. So we have two sides to it. There's the reactive, which is when you didn't plan for it, And you still have to deal with it, which is very much like COVID. And then other side is the proactive side where let's sit down and plan out all of the potential things. And being proactive, obviously, you're trying to think of all the potential problems and all the tales to those problems, right? That's right. And you're always going to have limited resources. So, you know, you don't want to boil the ocean, right? You want to be able to say, where should I have that laser focus? That is where I should apply those resources in order to add that resiliency. And so there's a, right. obviously a lot of attention being given to that today. Yep. You know, I mentioned earlier that I'm an automotive guy and the way automotive guys think <laughs> is this failure modes effects analysis, FMEA. And we would do a lot of FMEA meetings <laughs> where, and then there's a form that we'd have. But I would always say it's, it's more than a form. It's a way of life. I mean, for anybody in engineering and operations, you're always saying, what are the potential failure modes? And then what's the chances of you encountering that failure mode? And then what is the impact of it? <laughs> so if you say, well, yeah, that, you know what? We could get hit by meteors. Well, that's real. <laughs> and, you have to kind of deal with that. Now, there's another one, you know, that might be a lot less, <laughs> a lot less likely. And so you're always in this mode of saying, well, getting hit by a meteor is enormously disruptive, obviously, <laughs> and the earth. But you're also trying to understand what are the effects of each one of those, right? That's exactly right. So you really want to focus on where it would hurt the most. I'll tell you another quick story. So that you say that you're in the flower business and you grow flowers in Kenya. And you're going through a uh, Schiphol in Amsterdam. I'm sure you're very familiar with that. That airport. No, I'm not. What is that? <laughs> oh, Schiphol is the the international airport in Amsterdam, and it has a incredibly efficient cross dock operation. So the flowers come in from Kenya, they land in Schiphol, they're cross docked in matter of minutes on another plane, and they're flying over to JFK in order to serve the North American market. So to your point about, you know, a meteor, let's say all of a sudden a volcano goes off and now all flights are delayed for over two weeks and your flowers are sitting on the tarmac and you're losing money by the hour. So your CFO is very unhappy. So if you think about supply chain risk, you know, Joe, you'd probably say, well, Richard, what are you talking about? You said a meteor, how are you going to predict? Project when a volcano is going to go off? And the answer is absolutely no. But what if we take the perspective of looking at the fact that all of my profit 
is traversing one transportation lane. Would you worry about that? Oh, I see. So you say, but grow some of those flowers in Mexico, <laughs> if you get possible. You grow them in Mexico or maybe set up a relationship where you actually have a small amount of your transportation going through Miami. So now, you know, if it's a strike, a union strike at the airport or a volcano or a carrier bankruptcy, you have the ability to be able to redirect your operation in a way that you can continue to service your customers. Your competitors, if they haven't been adding resiliency, they're all going to be dialing for capacity. You're going to be moving product. Yep. So when we were prepping for this, I was talking to you about my daughter who buys PPE, personal protection equipment, and kind of specialized personal protection equipment, not just run-of-the-mill stuff because she works for a biotech. And she said that a lot of the PPE that she buys comes from Wuhan. So we might not have been able to predict this pandemic, but what we could have done is say, boy, we have an awful lot of our personal protection equipment comes from one place. That's exactly right. So, or maybe bigger picture, we're disproportionate amount of our sourcing is in China right now. Is that a problem? Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, University of Tennessee has done a wonderful study called EPIC, E-P-I-C, rating the risk associated with doing business in a particular country. And they looked at 64 countries and basically said, you know, from the perspective of physical infrastructure, from the perspective of political stability. So they had four different criteria and they rated them from zero to five. And then to do exactly what you said, I have an awful lot of product coming from one area and how at risk is that area for continuing to do business. So it's all about that visibility and thinking about it from the perspective of resiliency. Yep. So you gave me three big causes, I think, at the highest level, I think. So talk about those three. Sure. So we teach at Georgia Tech Supply Chain Risk Management, and what we focus on is to try to help people bring clarity with regard to all the things that could cause a disruption. So the first one that we focus on is geopolitical. And geopolitical is anything that is man-made that actually could cause a disruption. So that could be uh, tariffs. That could be a union strike. That can be, you know, anything that is a decision. Yeah, like a terrorist attack. (laughs) Terrorist attack is a great one. Anything man-made. The second one is going into the commercial. So the commercial relationships between you and your suppliers, your 3PLs, your carriers, could something happen there that would actually cause a significant disruption? disruption. And the last is the one that everyone does think about, which is the physical infrastructure, the physical supply chain. So tsunamis, tornadoes, earthquakes, anything that could cause a significant disruption. So we try to put them into those categories so that as people are looking at their operation, they can you know, have clarity with regard to how they're discussing it and more importantly, how they're going to actually add resiliency to that. Excellent. Excellent. And yeah, it's a, (laughs) when you open up this box and say, oh my God, look at all the potential problems and all the potential risk. And then you think, you know, we're going to have this next event, whatever that looks like. Right. Right. And, you know, if you think about this pandemic, you go, well, we could have never predicted this. Go online and type in Bill Gates on YouTube. And look, Bill Gates talked at a TED Talk years ago about how the next big disruption was going to be caused by some sort of pandemic. Yep. And he talked about how we should avoid it, what we should be doing. Yep, that's right. And you look and go, well, nobody paid close attention, obviously, but now we will. (laughs) Um, Prior to 9-11, we didn't worry about potential terrorist attacks. That's right. If you took um, any one of the surveys that were done, let's just say two years ago, and, you know, on one axis was the probability of the event, on the other axis was the financial impact of the event. In almost every case, you would see pandemic would be on the far left side on the bottom. Low impact, low probability. Where would it be today? (laughs) <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's it, that, that reminds me of kind of, you know, the innovators dilemma where typically the people who are the leaders in an industry, they see the competitive threat and they just minimize it in their mind. So it wasn't as if the big guys who made mainframe computers, they knew about the PC. They just kind of said, yeah, but who's going to use one? <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> they knew it. They probably knew it better than most. They probably had them at their house. Yeah, oh, that's nonsense. It's a toy. Yep. 
No, I think you're exactly right. You know, the reality of it is, is that COVID, the terrorists first and now COVID, it's a wake up call. And we believe strongly that shareholders and stakeholders are going to mandate that supply chain executives can demonstrate measurable resiliency that's been added to their operation because they're not going to invest their dollars in a company that isn't taking this seriously. Yep. So, so I think it's really important. So the other day I was interviewing Robert Cadena. He's one of the founders of Lean Staffing Solutions. They help set up satellite offices down in Columbia. And they, so they do a lot of back office work, a lot of sales work, marketing work for a lot of logistics companies, over a hundred logistics companies here in the U.S. And so they did planning for this. So when everything had to go remote suddenly in Colombia, which is where they have a lot of people, they have work in four different cities there, they were able to switch to remote very quickly, like almost overnight. So when COVID hit, they said, okay, we're ready for this. We can start working remote very quickly. Where other companies just kind of started, you know, floundering through it. And I'm not being critical. It's just, we didn't plan for it. So we don't know how to deal with it. Well, and let's build on that. So there's two major impacts that we are all seeing from that, from COVID. One is on the surge side where companies are, you know, just trying to keep up with the capacity associated with the products that are in such high demand. Obviously, PPE, as you mentioned with your daughter, but, you know, also just everybody knows the toilet paper story, right? But surge is a major consequence for some companies. And you could say that in a positive way, if you will, but it's still, it's putting the supply chain in high gear. But you got the flip side of it, which is, you know, look at food service and restaurants, absolutely the exact opposite problem. So the impact can be, you know, in multiple ways and, and having a company, as you just mentioned, that has planned for it, has thought through it and is able to act on it quickly. Those are the ones that are going to survive. Yep. And, you know, Richard, I mentioned (laughs) in my past failure mode effects analysis, a lot of engineers would use that. And I guess you could use the same type of tool for supply chain resiliency, but I'm sure you have a process that's more tailored to that. But one of my experiences was with FMEAs, you had to create one. So that's failure modes effects analysis. So the engineers would say, okay, yeah, I've got to do that. That's a check the box thing along the milestones. And I would always push people to say, don't do an FMEA by yourself in your cubicle. It's not going to be any good because you're just by your, you only have your own brain on the topic. So I would suspect that when you're talking about building resiliency, you need to get the whole supply chain team together and get different inputs, get in a conference room and really start beating that topic up. I'm assuming that's what you guys do. That's right. But it actually is a little more extensive than that, Joe. You do want everyone in the supply chain involved, obviously, in a rigorous way. But you really want the entire organization cross-functional participation because resiliency might be that, let's just use tariffs. I'm going to be able to think about how I'm going to manage tariffs. Well, in some cases, if I've got a really key customer that I'm, you know, is doing very well from a margin contribution, I may choose not to change the pricing associated with those customers. But I have other customers customers that are marginal or are unprofitable, then my strategy for resiliency may be to change the pricing. So you really want that cross-functional participation first for understanding what supply chain risk is and what the consequences could be, but then for them to be in the part of the solution for the problem, because it really is an enterprise decision and enterprise action, which means you need the entire cross-functional participation. Yep. And you know, you, you touched on something. So I know your business, Competitive Insights, you guys help companies understand profit contribution from all their different customers. And so when you're trying to protect your business, either, you know, in a reactive way or a proactive way, you need to know where your money's coming from. And I suspect a lot of people are listening going, of course, I know where my money's coming from. But what you're saying is not everybody does. Coca-Cola, which is obviously a very successful company, just realized Hey, we got like 200 products that aren't contributing like we want them to. Yeah, it really, it gets down to going beyond standard accounting principles. Because if everyone has their P&L and everyone has, you know, margin contributions, but what you really have to know is the visibility down to the category, the product, the customer, the channel. It has to be specific and it has to be accurate. If it's not both of those, it's not actionable. So being able to say, you know, generally we think we make this amount of money in this channel on this type of product is not good enough. You've got to have that laser focus. You've got to be able to understand exactly where you're making money, where you're losing money to make 
the smart decisions as to how you're going to grow your business. Well, and then again, when what you how to protect your business in terms of the resiliency, right? That's right. It's it is both. It's absolutely correct. Yes. I don't want to spend, you know, if the day before the resiliency exercise begins, I want to know where my money's, where I'm making my money, right? I don't want to spend a lot of money to protect business that's not that profitable to me. That's right. Because you're going to have limited resources. So where are you going to apply them? Yep. So talk a little bit about just to get, you know, at a high level, the process that companies need to go through to get this resiliency. Well, as at first, as we mentioned, it, it really requires cross-functional participation. It's not always easy, but as much as possible, that's a very key component. The next then is to be able to understand from a visibility perspective, the actual performance of the supply chain. And that goes all the way from the suppliers. How important are these suppliers to us as it relates to the contribution of margin that they give us from their products? And are those suppliers at risk? So referencing back to the University of Tennessee and saying, you know, do we have a concern that all of our product in this area is coming from this one country? But being able to have that visibility, whether it is a supplier, whether it is a mode of transportation, where you're storing your inventory, how you're servicing your customer, having that visibility and having making sure the organization is in sync with that. In other words, the cross-functional participation has allowed that communication to occur. Then you can start to ask really smart questions, questions associated with if this was to occur, how bad would that hurt? And being able then to think about what strategies you want to apply to be able to actually focus on those issues. So it, it gets back to it's very, you know, can be block and tackling. It doesn't have to be overly complicated, but it's got to be based on fact-based information that allows you to make smart decisions on a repeatable basis. Joe, to your point, you know, this is not a one-time exercise. What's going to be the next event? We don't know. But we know it's coming. So you have to have this type of capability in the organization as part of the ongoing management process in order to be able to have the resiliency both in reactive and proactive with regard to being able to protect the organization. Yep. You know, and in this day and age, the bar continues to rise. You said, you know, this isn't a one, don't look at this as an event. Like, yeah, once a year we do a supply chain resiliency exercise. No, this has to be something that you get into your head and you say, we never stop. We're going to continuously improve this process because what you run into is, and I hear this every once in a while where somebody will say, oh, well, that, yeah, but that's, you know, that came from a facility that's not ethical or a supplier that's not, we've heard about this about Foxconn. And you start to say, yeah, all of a sudden, if you're a consumer brand and you're using what all of a sudden became a newsworthy company because they weren't treating the environment or their people right, all of a sudden you're at risk. Somebody's boycotting your product. So this is never ending. That's, that's <laughs> the bar right. always raises. <laughs> that's right. Well, and let's get into the reality of that. Right now, it's top of mind for everyone because of COVID. But when COVID goes away, and it will eventually, and, you know, we have not had a disruption yet, people are going to start thinking about, well, am I really willing to allocate time for supply chain risk management when I've got, you know, this whole new product launch that I'm about to go into? The reality of it is, is that you are exactly right. This has to be an ongoing capability of the organization. What would drive that to be able to be sustainable? Well, it has to be that you are thinking about the profit contributions of the company. So if you go back to your board of directors, or you go back to your shareholders and say, yes, we spent an extra two or three percent of cost here in order to be able to add resiliency so that, in fact, we are better protected as we move forward in building this company. That's an argument that is sustainable as opposed to it just costs us three percent more to move our product into Mexico. Right, right. This is a big topic, but yeah, I always say the things that we have to do in the supply chain or in operations in general, sometimes get treated like that in an event or get treated like a form that I have to fill out. And so I really do think like, you know, the difference, I remember years ago when I still worked in automotive, we're talking to, I think it was Toyota, yeah, it was Toyota asking them if they did FMEAs and they, this is a benchmarking exercise with Chrysler and Toyota. And I remember them saying, yeah, we do those, but they didn't have a form so much. And then Somebody said, you guys do FMEAs. We live them. <laughs> and and I thought that was brilliant. Yep. And they said, that's how we think. And that's how we have to become with quality. You have to become that way with 
to supply chain resiliency, how you're treating your employee, it never can go away and become like a check the box exercise. That's right. It has to be ingrained into the culture that this is now, as you said, it's not just the generation, but it's the protection of the operating company's ability to make money. Yep. So give us four or five bullet points here and a little summary, Richard. Well, as I said earlier, we believe that COVID is going to create a situation where shareholders and stakeholders are going to require supply chain and overall executives to demonstrate that they have measurable resiliency, added measurable resiliency to their operation. It is going to be a requirement for all industries. If we just think about the impact this has had on a global basis. To do that, you have to have information that you trust and that you can take action on, which means that it has to be accurate and specific. And we believe it's important to be focusing that information on where it would matter the most if a disruption did occur or a disruption has occurred. And one way to measure that is how bad would it hurt from the ability to continue to keep our operating margins on a positive basis or even growing to thrive versus just survive. So that information then can be used on a cross-functional basis to create smart strategies that add resiliency to the supply chain and to do it on an ongoing basis as things change. I love it. I love it. So, Richard, I know you're involved with, in addition to Competitive Insights, I know you're also involved with Allen. Tell us a little bit about Allen and why they couldn't have picked a better guy or better company to get involved with them. (laughs) Allen is the American Logistics Aid Network, and it's an organization that everyone on this call, the supply chain industry, should be very proud of. Allen is 15 years old, and after Hurricane Katrina, A number of us got together across different industries and different groups to say, how does disaster response actually work? And we all had an opinion, but after two years of research, we realized that we really did not understand how it worked. And so we began to say, now, with the way that the mishandling was occurring in Katrina for a number of reasons, what can the supply chain industry do to actually add efficiency to disaster response? So when your family or my family is in the middle of a disaster, how can we help those people in a better way based on all the things we do as supply chain professionals? So we began that journey. And today, well, since then, we've been involved in almost every major disaster in the U.S. And it's really grown to where we have hundreds of people now who are volunteers, all pro bono, volunteering their time to be able to aid in disaster response. So I'll give you a wonderful story. This is really fantastic. The billboards that we all see that are, uh, you know, doing advertising are actually a vinyl product, not the electric ones, but the vinyl product. And we were approached two yep. years ago from a gentleman that was saying, I can use that vinyl product in order to help refugees with their shelters. And I can actually create a situation where they're in a more secure, safe, and sanitary environment. So we were working with that group to, you know, help them because it was, it was a good cause. But then we had these recent set of hurricanes. That one group was able to get 3,000 tarps on houses in Louisiana, which were actually stronger than the blue vinyl that, that normally is used. Yeah, and that's do- what we always see. Yep. And help these families in a very direct way where water wasn't getting back into their house and they were able to actually stabilize the situation. So it's amazing to us how many different ways the supply chain industry can use their expertise to actually help people who's in harm's way. And that's what Alan's all about. So if somebody wants to join, so we'll say one of the listeners here wants to join Alan, how do they go about that? And is there training or are you looking for individuals or companies or how does that work? Well, again, it's all pro bono. So the best way is www. That means you're free. (laughs) Right, right. That's right. A-L-A-N-A-I-D, all one word, A-L-A-N-A-I-D. I'll put a link in the show notes. Perfect. Dot org. And there's a website. You can register if you want to get involved. We have exercises and training. We have facilitation. You know, we are basically facilitating resources. We don't actually buy anything. We don't broker anything. What we do is we help connect dots, if you will, between needs that have been established and people who want to help, whether that's people or companies. Well, it's a great cause. And I'll tell you, you can see Every time we have a disaster, one of the biggest problems is the logistics. I mean, it's getting the stuff you need to the people who need it. That's right. You know, 
there's always another problem in the in the world and it's always nice to see the world respond in a way that works and every once in a while we'll have some sort of problem that we can't respond on a timely basis and boy if you look at those families they're always in such misery when they're going through this so Oh, yeah. Great cause. And, and they're lucky to have you, Richard, because, again, your background in supply chain resiliency and, and in data is probably really helpful. Super. Well, we're very proud of all the people that have helped make Allen the success that it is today. So tell us a little bit about your company, Competitive Insights. Well, as I said, we are 20 years old, 21 years old. We take native transactional data from any source that a company has, so from the supplier, you know, wherever the product is made or bought, all the way through to where it goes into the market it's going to be sold and to the customer. So the data associated with all of those transactions in its native format. We go through a rigorous data assurance process, this is all cloud-based processing, where we actually validate that information both using machine learning, AI, and subject matter expert validation. We transform that then to create a very specific and accurate cost to serve for every SKU sold to every customer through every channel. We do the same on the revenue side so that we actually have the net landed profit associated with every SKU sold to every customer. We use that information as a foundation to solve specific initiatives for a company. So the one we focus on today is supply chain risk. How do I use that information to add resiliency? But it can be around all types of things, such as SKU rationalization, as we mentioned before, product planning. It can be around... When you customer. say SKU rationalization, you basically mean... SKU rationalization is when I'm looking at my overall portfolio and deciding what products I should keep and what products I should not keep. And also, as I'm introducing new products into my portfolio, does that make sense as a result of historical performance? So I'll give you a good example of that. In apparel, actually measuring the profitability, not at just the SKU, the product level, but the color of the SKU. And we had an officer for this very well-known company who was very concerned about proliferation, meaning a lot of added complexity because of a lot of new products. And he said, you know, he walked into a product planning meeting and said, we have never made $1 of profit in the color of fuchsia on any product line we've ever sold. Why are we introducing fuchsia in this next release? Isn't that something? And I'll tell you, I know you don't work a lot with logistics companies, but you should because I guarantee if you were to get into logistics, you would find out, okay, you have all these different services and all these different customers. And I just know that there's got to be customers within that mix who are not profitable. Well, and that's, you know, that can be a value. If I'm a 3PL, that can be a real value added service because not only is it going to help me be really smart about where I'm focusing my energy, but I could also give that kind of information back to my customer. And what better way to add additional value as a service provider than to help your customers grow more profit? Oh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you could be a, <laughs> so, yeah, so there, potentially you could help a 3PL, but also you could join a 3PL and say, let me be a value add to the supply chain customers you work Absolutely. with. Absolutely. Yeah, we all need better data. And again, if you have bad data and you're making decisions based on it, you're heading in the wrong direction. Yep. Richard, we covered a lot. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Well, Joe, I just want to thank you for this opportunity and certainly for everyone who is listening on this podcast. We really appreciate your time and hope this has added value. It definitely has, for me anyway. So what I'll do, uh, Richard, is I'll put your company and your LinkedIn profile on the show notes along with Alan, the American Logistics Aid Network. And thank you so much for taking the time today. All right. Joe, let me just add that if people are interested in learning more about this and want to actually have information to be able to circulate within their company, please go to the website that Joe's going to put up. But we have uh, white papers on this. We have other material that we'd be delighted to get to people to help them with their communication internally. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you for listening to my podcast. Your continued support is very much appreciated. Until next time, Onward and Upward. You've been listening to the Logistics of Logistics podcast, where we engage in conversations with experts in the logistics field. If you're an expert and would like to be featured on the Logistics of Logistics podcast, please email Joe Lynch at joe at the logisticsoflogistics.com. 